Good morning, I am Suzanne Lawson with Constellation Consulting, and we are pleased to present the 2020 New Mexico Summit on Health Equity Virtual Series. This series is funded by the New Mexico Department of Health Tobacco Use Prevention and Control Program, and today is our final session in the series. For more information about the summit and to view recordings from our past sessions, please visit our website at nmhealthequity.org. While originally intended to be an in-person summit to address health equity within the live, work, play model, the 2020 summit, New Mexico Summit on Health Equity became a virtual series this year due to COVID-19. We appreciate the efforts of everyone involved in transitioning this event online, including our presenters, the Department of Health, Alliance Audiovisual, and the members of our Constellation Consulting Team. For Zoom security reasons, for today's session, we are utilizing the Zoom webinar feature and attendees' webcams and microphones have been disabled. If you would like to introduce yourself and engage with other attendees today, please feel free to do so in the chat feature. If you have a question for today's presenter, please use the Q&A function and we will address as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. Any materials provided by today's presenter will be posted on our website. You can also access a recording of today's presentation, along with recordings of our past sessions at nmhealthequity.org. Following today's session, you will receive an email <clears throat> with a link to an online evaluation. We encourage everyone to take this evaluation. If you would also like to receive community health worker or social worker CEUs or continuing medical education units, you must complete the evaluation. CEU certificates will be emailed out within 30 days of completion of the evaluation. This year, we are excited to offer you all an additional way to engage and connect with others participating in this year's Summit on Health Equity Virtual Series. As an illustration of our continued growth as a community, we have invited you to participate in our virtual mosaic. The mosaic has been built over the past several weeks and is made up of photos that you all sent in to us, as well as images from our presentations. To view the completed live mosaic, please visit nmhealthequity.org. And thank you to everyone who submitted photos and images. And finally, before we begin today, while the Summit on Health Equity virtual series has provided opportunities for education, awareness, and understanding over these last few weeks, we know that some of you would like to continue with conversations. Next Thursday, July 2nd, from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m., our community partners at the Public Health Association of New Mexico will begin hosting health equity conversations. If you would like to learn more or to be added to their email list, please go to nmpha.org or contact NMA, NMPHA co-presidents Melissa Ontiveros at melissa.ontiveros at nmpha.org or Shelly Manlev at shelly.man-lev at nmpha.org. Today, we are excited to host Dr. Nora Wang as our presenter for this sixth and final session in our Summit on Health Equity Virtual Series. Nora Wang is president of the Caucus of Asian American Psychiatrists of the American Psychiatric Association. She is a practicing psychiatrist and an award-winning author and historian. She is the author of blogs for Psychology Today and the Huffington Post, as well as two books, The Daily Practice of Compassion, a History of the, of the University of New Mexico School of Medicine, Its People and Its Mission, 1964 through 2014, and The Kitchen Shrink, A Psychiatrist's Reflections on Healing in a Changing World. Dr. Wang also generously is providing complimentary copies of The Kitchen Shrink to the first 50 people who registered for this session and included their address during the registration process. Some of you may have received uh, hand-delivered copies yesterday. Um, we'll, we will continue hand-delivering those copies as well as mailing out copies to those of you outside of the greater Albuquerque area. Born in Brazil, Dr. Wang earned a BA in genetics and an MA in English literature from the University of California, Berkeley, and she is a graduate of the Yale School of Medicine. A resident of Albuquerque for 22 years, she co-led an effort with effort which successfully changed the New Mexico Constitution and removed an unforced section which forbade Asians and persons of color from owning land. She is historian of the School of Medicine and clinical associate professor at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. You can read her complete bio on our website at nmhealthequity.org. 
Please welcome Dr. Nora Wang. Hi, um, still getting used to things like this. Such an honor to be here and thank you, Suzanne, for inviting me to speak today. Thank you, Constellation Consulting and New Mexico Department of Health. Um, as as uh, Suzanne mentioned, I've been a resident of Albuquerque for over 22 years. I grew up in California, um, but was born in Brazil. So I danced the samba before I could walk. As an Asian American, um, we are a minority of less than 2% of New Mexico, but um, I guess I'm part of an even greater minority of Chino Latinos. Um, as far as I know, there are only two of us, myself and my daughter here, who, who I've met in New Mexico all these years. And I, I'll just start with a confession that um, I really love it when people call me Chinita. Okay. Let's see, so um, uh, the, the book that my, my daughter delivered to many of you yesterday is The, the Kitchen Shrink. Um, it's my memoir as a woman and a psychiatrist, but it's also the story of medicine evolving from a uh, charitable profession into the profit-driven industry that it is today. Um, it tells the story of hospitals in the United States and New Mexico, which were founded as charitable organizations, often named for saints like St. Joseph in Albuquerque, St. Vincent in Santa Fe, and how the communities built and gave to their local medical systems. And then in, in 1980, the American healthcare system became for profit. Um, it was done subtly. I think a lot of us don't even know that this happened, but it, that this is why um, uh, uh, these healthcare systems are now being run for by for-profit uh, corporations um, out of state, which take money out of our communities. Um, my second book, uh, The History of the UNM School of Medicine. Let's see, how do I go forward here? Okay. I, I'm also gonna be talking about the, the work of George Isidore Sanchez, uh, who I think has a lot of solutions for, for New Mexico, uh, a native New Mexican and author of The Forgotten People. And I think he's kind of a forgotten New Mexican. Um, so, okay, so why equality? Why is equality so important? Where does the idea come from in the United States? And it, it goes back to the Declaration of Independence. Um, here's a copy of it, July 4th, 1776. And in, in, in the declaration is, is this phrase, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Okay. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has made it pretty clear that 244 years later, um, after the founding of the nation, equality is really far from a reality. So uh, who's dying of COVID-19 in the United States? Um, this is data from the Centers of Disease Control from uh, uh, February 1st to June 6th. And you see that um, in the older age groups over here, uh, individuals 85 and older, um, African-Americans are dying at twice the rate as uh, Caucasians. Hispanics are, are somewhere in between, still dying at far higher rates than Caucasian Americans. Um, in the younger age groups, the, the disparity is also pretty great. Um, at age, between ages 75 and 84, um, African Americans are dying um, more than three times the rate as Caucasian Americans. Hispanics about more than twice the rate of Caucasian Americans. And, and on, on downwards, you can see that graph. Uh, the Brookings Institute has put together this, this graph. Um, African Americans make up uh, 12 and a half of the U.S. population, but uh, about 22.4 percent of COVID deaths. So it's a huge disparity there. Uh, Professor Jarvis Chen at the Harvard School of Public Health explains it that um, that uh, people of color have a greater probability of exposure from living in more crowded living situations and also multi-generational households. Um, 
more frontline jobs, but also poor pre-COVID health, greater health care inequities, lifestyle inequities, uh, such as, as diet and um, uh, exercise, uh, greater rates of obesity, hypertension, and high, uh, heart disease in uh, communities of color, but also poor access to COVID-19 testing and healthcare. African-American workers are more likely than other workers to have frontline jobs. Uh, you see that uh, um, all worker, the African-Americans are about 11.9% of the population here, but there's 17% of frontline workers. Now I'll get to New Mexico um, uh, later for most of the presentation. There's also a stark inequities um, in COVID for the American Indian and Alaska Native uh, populations. Um, you see here in New Mexico, uh, Native Americans make up about 9% of the population, but account for about 50% of uh, COVID uh, deaths, which is a, a huge, huge uh, health disparity. Um, this is from the Kaiser Family Foundation and among uh, the uninsured in, in the country, this, this data is, is a couple of years old, but um, whites, about 8% are uninsured uh, and lack healthcare insurance. Among Hispanics, it's 19% nationally. And uh, among Native American and Alaska Native populations, almost a quarter uh, were uninsured as of a couple of years ago. Okay, so um, equity. Um, the right to equity is in the founding documents of the nation, but it's clearly still something we need to work toward. And that's, that's one of the points I wanna make today is that each of us can make a difference. And it's, it's the effort that we put into it that will help us achieve equity. Um, uh, and the following slides will show why equity isn't just gonna happen on its own. So, you know, once again, we have this founding document of this nation stating that um, it's self-evident that all men are created equal. Yet, uh, you had American slavery for the following almost 100 years uh, until the Emancipation Proclamation of 1862. So, um, after stating that this nation was founded on the premise that all men are created equal. Um, from 1776 until 1862, you had slavery. Um, and uh, so here you have uh, slaves being freed in 1862. And then after that, um, a couple of, of monumental um, amendments to the US Constitution, um, assuring equality in, in the country. And here we have the 13th Amendment, which states neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall be unduly, shall be duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So um, the slavery was outlawed and uh, this was passed by Congress in 1865 uh, and ratified by a majority of states that same year, but really, really interestingly, um, not accepted by many states until kind of recently. Um, Mississippi only ratified the 13th Amendment in 2013. Um, so, and then we have the 14th Amendment, which was uh, adopted in 1868. Um, this is where many of our civil rights come from, is the 14th Amendment. Um, just, just state the, this clause here. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the laws. So that was 1868. So right after that, you had a whole bunch of Jim Crow laws which said, okay, equal, but separate. And so that led to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, which desegregated um, 
the, the United States, stating that you, uh, this equal but separate doesn't, hasn't really worked out. It's not really equal. And um, so now, uh, because of the Civil Rights Act, it's illegal to discriminate on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Um, all people have equal accesses to pl places and, and to employment, I'm sorry. Schools were desegregated. Uh, there's the right to vote for all people. But interestingly, only this month, uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that the Civil Rights Act uh, applies to um, uh, the LGBT community. So have equality and equal protection in the United States been achieved? Um, this was from two years ago, the Me Too movement, where uh, women um, are finally achieving more protection uh, under, under the laws. And this is from this month. <laughs> Uh, uh, protests across the nation demanding equal protection for, for the African-American community in the Black Lives Matter movement. So um, even though the uh, founding documents of the nation from 1776 says that all lives, all men are created equal, it's, it's really an ongoing process and the effort of all of us makes a difference. Okay, so going to New Mexico, um, here are statistics I got from the website uh, yesterday. So just in terms of uh, COVID, uh, COVID um, deaths, um, I'm sorry, this is just COVID cases. Uh, the um, uh, Native American population is over 50% of cases and uh, somewhere around nine to 11% of the population um, Hispanics, who are 52% of the population of New Mexico, account for about 29% of, of uh, COVID cases. So just huge um, percentages in, in the uh, communities of color. Okay. Uh, this is from the Albuquerque Journal, May 30th. Huge disparity in COVID-19 death rates for Native Americans in New Mexico. The article goes on to state that uh, Native Americans are about 11% of the population, but about 57% of COVID-19 inf infections happen among Native Americans. Um, and about 72% of COVID hospital hospitalizations in New Mexico are of Native Americans. Native Americans are infected at 14 times the rate of others and dying at 19 times the rate of others. Uh, so, so why is this happening? Um, there's more poverty on uh, uh, Native American reservations. About 30% of Navajo homes lack running water. So it's uh, all these recommendations of washing your hands for 20 seconds, singing the song Happy Birthday twice. It's, it's really hard to, to do when you have no running water in your home. Also, the Indian Health Service is seriously underfunded. It spends... Um, uh, well, the VA spends about three times as much per patient uh, as the Indian Health Service does per patient. And uh, in the Indian Health Service across the nation, about 25 to 30 percent of uh, the provider spots are vacant. Um, so a quarter to a third of vacancies um, among healthcare providers in the IHS. According to Shervin Azami of the National Indian Health Board, um, he, he stated, less funding, less accessibility to care, less quality of care for those reasons you have chronic underlying health conditions that go years and years without getting treated. You have less access to care and treatment. As a result, health disparities increase over time. Um, so one turn now to some of the roots of the disparities. So why, why are, is there so much disparity in, in New Mexico? Um, so let's start with the Hispanic population or the native New Mexican population. Um, 
and I, I wish I we we could I could see your faces and I can ask like um, what everybody here thinks of of George Isidore Sanchez um, and uh, his book The Forgotten People. I got this on Amazon recently. It was like sixty bucks and for you know this little book, but it, it I think it's so important for New Mexico. It's it's out of print, but I want to sh share um, some of the things that were were said in this what I, in my opinion, really important book. So it was published in 1940. Um, a little bit about George Isidore Sanchez. Um, uh, he's often called the forgotten New Mexican. He was born in Albuquerque, native New Mexican on both sides of his family. By age 16, he was a public school teacher in um, just outside of Albuquerque, graduated from UNM published uh, his first book, The Forgotten People in 1940. And um, apparently he had some uh, disagreements with the New Mexico State Legislature. So in 1940, he became a full professor at the University of Texas in Austin. He went on to be a founding father of the Chicano movement in the United States. Um, and he was doing this during World War II, so he, this was way before the 60s. He was a national president of LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens. He organized Latinos to elect John F. Kennedy, and, and he did scholarship for Justice Thurgood Marshall and was involved in the desegregation of schools in the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, here's his uh, biography out from Yale University Press a few years ago. Um, there are buildings and schools named for him across the country, uh, this native son of Albuquerque. Um, so this is the George I. Sanchez building at University of Texas, Austin. It's the College of Education. Um, so this is a quote from NBC News five years ago. Uh, Though a dozen or so schools in California and Texas are named for him, the noted scholar and author was virtually unknown in Albuquerque until recently. A 2012 Associated Press story on Sanchez and his absence as a known figure in his own state led to a push for recognition among New Mexico educators. Uh, so now we have the George I. Sanchez Collaborative Community School in the South Valley. So finally, um, some recognition in his native Albuquerque. So what did he say? Uh, the forgotten people, um, so he talks about the settlement of New Mexico more than 300 years ago, and he states uh, it forms a, this is a, a quote, um, the settlement of New Mexico more than 300 years ago forms a thrilling chapter in the history of the new world. The blowing of trumpets, the glistening of armor, it behooves the careful student to look beyond the glitter of adventure and to observe in the events the birth of a new people. And I want to in, in, um, emphasize that he is calling um, New Mexicans different from Spanish. Another quote, beneath the glory of the conquest, there are the stark realities of a people in the making, the daily struggles of normal human beings who under the stress of greatly limited circumstances sought to wrest a meager living from a forbidding land. So basically New Mexicans, um, had subsistence living for about 300 years here in, in this semi-desert land, isolated from the world, um, descended from, from Spanish uh, settlers and from Native Americans, but kind of because of uh, back then you had no telephone, television, newspapers, <laughs> no internet definitely. Um, so basically, New Mexico, New Mexicans were isolated from the world and Spain as the rest of the world modernized, um, is one of the things uh, George Sanchez says. Then New Mexico became a United States territory in 1846. And, and yet, according to uh, George Sanchez, um, hardly any resources were devoted to bring New Mexicans into the modern world. Um, and this led Sanchez to call um, New Mexicans, stepchildren of a nation. He, some interesting things he says in, in this book is that, um, in his opinion, uh, public schools actually work against the New Mexican. 
it works against the New Mexican linguistically and culturally in that um, the instruction and every and and the grades are um, every most almost everything occurs in English and uh, all the the grading um, is is based on um, the performance of the student in English whereas uh, the student may be fluent in another language and uh, New Mexico um, I believe it has, it's always judged as having one of the lowest literacy rates in the United States. But in terms of being bilingual, um, New Mexico has the highest percentage of bilingual people in the country. Uh, fully a third of New Mexicans are bilingual, um, speaking English as well as Spanish or Native American language. Um, so, uh, uh, New Mexicans um, have a very rich cultural heritage and linguistic um, uh, complexity, yet uh, basically their education occurs in English. And, and so, um, you know, this, this is Sanchez saying, not me saying, but it is, is Albuquerque public school system, is it kind of like uh, sending a Native Americans to boarding school where they are forbidden from speaking their native languages and um, everything happens in English. So, so Sanchez um, said that um, the public school system in New Mexico works against New Mexicans in a lot of ways and, and discriminates against them. He also said that IQ tests discriminate against New Mexicans. So um, what, what are solutions? And I, I thought he had some really good solutions um, in this 1940 book that, that are, are still relevant today he suggests that uh, New Mexicans should become a, a census category so that special funding can be obtained from foundations and the federal government for New Mexicans, um, for um, education of New Mexicans in, in the schools, for social services, because um, New Mexicans are a, a unique and special population. Um, and, and I noticed that, that there are, uh, there's so many census categories. Um, even Cuban American is, is a census category. Um, uh, African American, um, Native American, Native Alaskan, but yet Native New Mexican is not a census category. So I, I think this is a huge solution. I, I, I hope that this can be taken on at some point because I think it's a good idea that if this category is, is um, created, then there can be funding sought for uh, the special circumstances of New Mexicans. He also thought that mindsets needed to be changed and that New Mexico needed to focus not on its romantic past and its Spanish conquistador past, but on being New Mexicans and, um, and, and to look at the poverty that is happening here and, and to address it. Okay. Um, I want to to also talk a little bit about healthcare in Albuquerque, which is the topic of uh, my two books. So it's something I, I, I know um, something about. Um, so, okay, so Albuquerque's first hospital was built in 1902. This is a, a photo of St. Joseph's Sanatorium. It was founded by the Sisters of Charity from Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, uh, Sister Hyacinth was a, a nun who suffered from tuberculosis. And so she came to Albuquerque because of the climate and, and dryness, which was uh, good for people suffering from tuberculosis when there was no cure. So that's uh, the Albuquerque's first hospital, St. Joe's. Um, in 1908, the Reverend Hugh Cooper came to Albuquerque uh, he was also suffering from tuberculosis, and uh, he founded the Southwestern Presbyterian Sanatorium, and today we know it as Presbyterian Health System. And let's see, here we go. Um, in 1913, uh, William Randolph Lovelace arrived in, in Albuquerque. He was also suffering from tuberculosis. Um, he was trained at the Mayo Clinic, and so he started um, his own practice in Albuquerque based on the Mayo Clinic uh, model of having specialties uh, represented. And here's his son, William R. Lovelace II, who uh, carried on his legacy. And today, um, 
uh, we have we still have loveless health system here here's the newcomer in 1954 the bernalillo county indian hospital was founded by an act of congress um, to serve native americans and so uh, there were about 100 beds always reserved at uh, the bernalillo county indian hospital um, it is now the UNM hospital, and you see this picture from 54. There's not a lot around uh, this building. Now there's the Bill, big Bill and Barbara Richardson Pavilion, um, a, a lot of other buildings. I, I believe that the Indian Health Service still owns the land and uh, this building and, and rents it to UNM for a dollar a year or something like that. And then the UNM School of Medicine was founded in 1961. So um, a, a story that I, I write about in, in this book, which is the history of the UNM School of Medicine, is that four local organizations served Albuquerque's medical needs for much of the 1900s. So for almost a century, you had St. Joe's, Presbyterian, Loveless, and UNM serving the medical needs of Albuquerque. They were all charitable organizations. Um, they were built by the community's labor and donations. And in fact, this was true of hospitals in general. Um, in the United States, there were actually laws in every state forbidding for-profit corporations from being in medical care. There were uh, courts across the country ruled that um, profit was not compatible with health care. And this is because in the early 1900s, there were all these tonic salesmen and quacks. And, and then there was a huge healthcare reform effort in the early 1900s. And that's when the Food and Drug Administration was founded in 1906. And, and then for almost a century, profit as a motive was, was banished from healthcare. And in most of the country, even most of the world, even now, um, the more advanced, uh, the, the countries with more advanced economies, um, healthcare is not for profit. Um, here we have the, the definition of hospital to this day in the Merriam-Webster dictionary is that it is a charitable institution for the needy, aged, infirm, or young, an institution where the sick or injured are given medical or surgical care. Um, the word hospital is, is, has the word hospitality in it, de de derived from the French word hostel. Um, and, and even to this day, the, the definition, if you look in Merriam-Webster, it's that it's a charitable institution. In, in 1980, um, uh, the, the Reagan administration in, uh, uh, held seminars around the country encouraging for-profit cor corporations to, and they called it the, um, the kind of untapped or virgin market of medical care. Um, there were publications that said that the healthcare system in the United States was, was just ripe for profit. And uh, that's because uh, communities like Albuquerque had been putting a lot into their healthcare systems for um, 80 years or so. So this is a history I write about in my own memoir. I was actually an intern in uh, uh, Washington DC at the time in the public health service. I was like 18 years old and I remember when this happened and I remember that um, they called it decentralization but it was in, in, in fact asking the for-profit sector to get into health care. So as a result what what happened just uh, so Loveless was founded in 1913. It was built by the community's funds and labor but uh, after um, uh, healthcare corporations were invited into healthcare in 1980, Cigna um, came in and acquired 80% of Loveless. And I, I looked this up in, in the stock charts. In 1990, Cigna um, uh, stock was uh, worth $4.17 a share. But within 10 years, um, Cigna stock was $41.98 a share. Um, you know, it, it was owning uh, uh, hospitals around the country, such as Loveless here, but also not just in Albuquerque, but across the country. And then in 2003, um, 
Loveless and St. Joseph's were acquired by Ardent, a private equity firm out of Nashville. So um, sadly, uh, four healthcare systems served Albuquerque's needs for most of the 1900s. And now two of the four are owned by a Nashville for-profit equity firm. And here I write in the kitchen shrink. I, I think this is really sad. Um, prideful New Mexicans still speak of how our loveless system provided medical care to our first space astronauts. It's been getting a drink of water. Um, they were Alan Shepard and John Glenn in 1959. Like community owned hospitals across the country, charitable organizations and private donors once gave generously to Loveless to support its worthy mission of caring for the health needs of New Mexicans. But in 1985, shortly after the federal government began encouraging for-profit businesses to enter medicine, Loveless was purchased by Cigna, a corporation whose stock value on the New York Stock Exchange doubled, then quadrupled, then altogether skyrocketed more than eightfold uh, just in 20 years. Actually, it was more than tenfold. In 1999, this health system that a proud community once put money into is now owned by a for-profit corporation taking money out of the community to pay executives and stockholders around the country. And, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just say it, I think a lot of our local community hospitals have become storefronts for for-profit corporations to take money out of local communities. Um, this is contributing to the poverty of New Mexico. And I just don't know why we allow this to happen. <laughs> Suzanne and I were chatting before we, we started this talk and I just said, why is this happening? Why do we allow this to happen? I think um, part of it is I think a lot of us don't know this, is, this is, ha has happened. Um, so that's one reason why I, I wrote this book is that I wanted to call attention to this Okay, so um, uh, individuals can make a difference. And I, I, I wanna encourage people um, listening here today, um, you're interested in health equity, um, obviously, because uh, you're participating in this uh, summit. And, um, and, and so I, I think there are 2 million some people in this state and a um, hundred or so people registered for this conference, and I, I think you're the people who are, are, who are going to make a difference. So um, something I write about in the Daily Practice of Compassion is uh, these two UNM medical students, and here they are. Um, they look like it's the 70s. Uh, they were the class of 72. So this is Raymond Sanchez, and um, he calls himself, uh, he was like a 10th or some generation New Mexican. Um, he said to me, um, uh, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. And, um, and he had relatives from throughout New Mexico. And, and he realized that most of New Mexico had no medical care. And in most communities, there was not one single physician. And so he, he thought, well, um, sending UNM medical students to these to these uh, uh, communities um, is is better than nothing. <laughs> it's it's better than what they have now. So he he published a paper at, about rural healthcare in New Mexico in the Rocky Mountain Medical Journal in 1971, and out of that came something called Project Porfinir or Project for the Future, and uh, this is how uh, the UNM School of Medicine's rural health program started. Uh, this was um, the first rural health program. I, I think at some point there, before this, there was a, a nurse who, who went out. Um, and, uh, and aside from that one nurse, I think uh, this, this, that was the first, um, this is how the rural health program in New, in New Mexico, at UNM started. And um, whenever you look at US News and World Report, um, when it comes to rural health programs, uh, UNM always ranks in the top one or two. Also, what Paul, Chancellor Paul Roth says is that um, 
UNM has the largest campus in, in the world because it's the entire state of New Mexico. So this is something that was started by two students. <clears throat> Somebody else who made a huge difference is um, uh, Professor Alonzo Atencio, uh, who was a native New Mexican. I, I think he was from Mora. And he was the Assistant Dean of Student Affairs and Director of Minority Programs at the UNM School of Medicine between 1970 and 1994. And at some point he realized that if he was going to um, uh, make a difference in the health of New Mexicans, he needed to start recruiting uh, high school students into medical school. And so he went to every single high school in the entire state and spoke to high school students. Um, he coached them into college and he kept track of them through college. Um, some of them went to Harvard and Stanford. Um, he, he kept track of them and he coached them into taking the MCAT and coached them into getting into medical school. So he made these high school students into, um, into doctors and uh, among the high school students who recruited are um, Dr. Valerie Romero Leggett, who is uh, now the first vice chancellor for diversity at uh, UNM School of Medicine. Another high school student he recruited was Loretta Cordova Dorotega, class of 87, who is now chair of the Department of Pediatrics at UNM School of Medicine, and Alfredo Vigil, uh, class of 1977 at UNM School of Medicine, who is a former New Mexico Secretary of Health. Um, and uh, Dr. Vigil says, I have spent my career in rural clinics and helping the medically underserved because of Alonzo Atencio. A hundred other physicians would say the same. And indeed, um, uh, Dr. Romero Leggett tells me that she, she was just this high school student and had no idea that she could actually become a doctor until Alonzo Atencio showed up in her high school classroom and said, no, you can do it. So I just wanted to put this forth as the, the difference one person can make. Okay, let's see. Um, so I have to put something in about Asian Americans in New Mexico and um, something I, I took on that um, I'm, I'm proud of that I did. Um, so Asian Americans are really underrepresented in New Mexico, less than 2% of the population. And my opinion is that that is tied to the, um, the poverty of New Mexico, that it's a 21st century and, and we have a 21st century global economy. And how can you have, how can you participate in this, uh, a global economy with only 2% of your population being Asian American? Um, but in terms of why a lot of Asian Americans don't come to New Mexico, um, uh, I think uh, a lot of Asian Americans know about the case of Wen Ho Lee. In 1999, um, uh, Dr. Lee, he was a Taiwanese New Mexican man, and he was indicted for selling nuclear lab secrets to the People's Republic of China. Um, he was held in solitary confinement for a year until he went to trial. And then when he did go to trial, uh, the, the judge actually even apologized to him uh, because there was just no grounds for, for this. Um, anybody who knows anything about uh, global politics or the relations between Taiwan and the People's Republic of China knows that um, they don't even have anything to do with each other. <laughs> the last person to be selling secrets to the People's Republic of China would be a Taiwanese person. Um, in any case, um, uh, up until 2006, the New Mexico Constitution actually had a, a measure in it preventing Asians from owning land. Um, it was aimed at Asians, but it actually um, apply to all persons of color. And uh, this was because in 1790, the, the first immigration and naturalization law was that only white people could become naturalized citizens of the United States. And so, and, and, and the word they used was white. 
And so from 1790 onwards, um, uh, uh, only white people could become naturalized. And, and so then you had cases like Bhagat Singh versus the, the state of California or Bhagat Singh versus the US. Um, Bhagat Singh was a, an Indian, uh, an East Indian uh, person who lived in California. And he said, I'm Caucasian, Indians are Caucasian. So can I become naturalized? And, and the, the United States Supreme Court said, yes, you are Caucasian, but you are not white. And so you cannot become naturalized. So um, in, in essence, um, only white people could become naturalized in the United States um, up until uh, 1964, until the Civil Rights Act. But um, when New Mexico became a state in 1912, um, so basically there was a, a clause here, section 22 of Article 2 of the Constitution of New Mexico um, stated, until otherwise provided by law, no alien ineligible for citizenship shall acquire title, leasehold, or other interests or to real estate in New Mexico. So this phrase, aliens ineligible for citizenship, basically means anybody who's not white um, because of the 1790 law. And um, so at some point, and I was reading in the New York Times that only New, New Mexico and Florida had this kind of law and, and still on the books, um, these laws preventing people of color from owning land once existed in half of the United States. But by 2006, only New Mexico and Florida had such a law. It, it was unenforced, but and I, to my knowledge, it was never enforced in New Mexico, but it was sh sure an embarrassment and, and a real humiliating thing to read on, on um, titles and leases of homes in Knob Hill even. Um, and so, uh, so in any case, um, some, some girlfriends and I took this on and um, uh, got, got this law changed. Um, the Southwest Law Caucus had tried to get it changed. And so uh, they, they laid the foundation. Um, however, they were not successful. And then, um, so then we tried again and we, we got this change. So it required um, putting a measure on the state ballot and getting 50% of votes in the state. But, but still there's, there's anti-Asian sentiment here. This is uh, the Asian noodle shop in, on Central Avenue during COVID, vandalized. So just in, in conclusion, I'd like to conclude uh, with a couple of thoughts. Um, and this is from the Lord of the Rings, from Lord of the Ring fans. Um, just thinking about the time that we're in right now, uh, this is from Gandalf. I, I wish it, uh, Frodo says, I wish it need not to have happened in my time. And Gandalf replies, so do I, so do all who live to see such times but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what we do with the time that is given to us. And just a, a closing thought about uh, COVID is, is that um, it, it used to be um, when I first got into the medical profession, I was a medical student in the 80s, um, back, back then we still thought of each life as being equally precious and each life as being worth our, our best effort. But um, now it's our healthcare system is for profit and uh, the UNM medical system is, is still the, is now the only medical system in, in um, the only hospital in, in this city, as far as I can tell, that even tries to take care of everybody. Um, uh, uh, what used to be St. Joe's, what used to be Love, you know, what still is loveless and Presbyterian are, are, are um, they, they aim to take care of the insured and not, and not everybody. Um, but in COVID-19 has taught us lots of, uh, lots of lessons. And, and one lesson um, it's taught us is that it just takes one person to see an entire epidemic. There was one lawyer who brought COVID to New Rochelle, New York, and it became a 
it's huge hotspot. Um, all the, the cases in Washington may have happened from one person. So I, I, I remember recently I was, I was giving a, a talk at, um, to a, a history class uh, at UNM. It was um, a class on the history of the University of New Mexico. And, and somebody from, from the audience, a, a, a young man raised his hand and said, and said um, I work hard, I um, am a good citizen, why should I be paying for the health care of, of people who are lazy and who are not working? And, um, and then, and my reply to him, and this was before COVID, I, I said, because if he is sick, <laughs> he affects you. And, um, and uh, what do you know? <laughs> it's become more true now than ever. And, but also just for humanitarian reasons, I mean, what kind of society do we become when, when some lives are valued more than others? And uh, the kind of society I think that we all wanna live in is, is where life is precious. Um, so with COVID, will the health of each individual finally become equally important? Okay. Uh, Thank you again for, for being here. Um, I'd like to take questions or discussion at this point. Thanks so much, Dr. Wang. Um, we will now move into our Q&A. If you have any questions for Dr. Wang, please utilize the Q&A tab or the chat tab within Zoom. We do have a couple of questions okay. already. Uh, Benny, Benny actually thanked you for the book and said he would pass it on to his son who is in medical school. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> you know what he's getting uh, into. Uh, he also said, would the issues George Sanchez was pointing to be considered, mis uh, I'm sorry, Benny, I'm gonna try, mistazahe, mis um, the rejection of the indigenous culture in favor of the European culture especially rejecting the new people being formed, mestizos of indigenous and European blood. So thank you so much for that question. And I'd, I'd actually be very curious to hear what you might have to say about that. Um, uh, you probably know more about that than, than I do. Um, but just from my reading his book, I, I believe he's, he's saying that, uh, uh, that New Mexicans should be considered New Mexicans. It's it's uh, that it's you know um, to new people, not not Spanish, not um, not uh, Native American, um, but but New Mexican. And um, uh, yeah, so in in the in this book, I don't know if you all can see me, but I started with the story of, um, let's see, Paul Roth's, okay, uh, of them, Earl and Rebecca Salazar um, from OK and Wingay. I don't know if you can see this. I, I'm, let me see what, where my view options are. But um, in any case, I mean, Earl is blonde hair and blue-eyed, um, he considers himself descended from the Spanish, but he's um, the governor of Oke Wenge. And I, I think they, um, they're, they're New Mexicans. I think, um, so one, once again, uh, um, I, I will limit my expertise to uh, Chinese Brazilians, Californians in, in Albuquerque. Um, I'd like to hear what other people have to say about um, about George I. Sanchez and uh, about the whole concept of, of New Mexicans. Sure, yeah. I've actually, we've actually opened Benny's mic so he can actually um, oh, you, share Benny. his thoughts thank now. You. Uh, yes, good, good afternoon, Dr. Wang. Hi. Uh, uh, real quick, so you know, mestizo is the term used for uh, people who are mixed uh, indigenous and uh, European. And the term mestizaje means uh, a rejection of the indigenous culture towards the European culture, and uh, and you're seeing it playing out here in New Mexico, you know, around the statues of Juan Doñate, for example. 
So uh, uh, I think uh, George Sanchez was pointing to that, not calling it Mr. Saki at that point. I'm not sure why I'm getting so much feedback. Yeah, I tried muting and I don't know that it helped. So um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Wang, there we go. You were on mute for a second there. Um, so do you have thoughts to share on what Benny said? Benny, th thank you so much for, for bringing that up. And um, I will have to say that I, I thank you for educating me about the term mestizaje. I, I had not heard about, heard of this term before. Um, so I, I'm a psychiatrist. I do some history and that there's a lot that I don't know about. Um, can you say more about Misty Sahe? Okay, Ben, I'm gonna take you off mute again. Um, and if you can okay. take your phone off a speaker, that may help. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, that's yes, better. much better. Okay, uh, so uh, again, Dr. Wang, uh, here in the Americas, the, uh, the concept of mestizaje came out of, out of the, the conflict that occurred when um, the mixing of the indigenous and the European blood happened and created the new form uh, called mestizo. And, uh, you know, the rejection a lot of times of one culture over the other. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I think George Sanchez was pointing to, to this new form, you know, New Mexican. If you think about it, New Mexico is really a take on Mexico being uh, transported into a new place and it becoming a new uh, territory. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for, for us who are Mexican ancestry, we hear the term Nuevo Mexico. It means you know, uh, some, some of the ancestors coming from Mexico moved into this new territory and called it Nuevo Mexico, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and really, what, what now you're seeing is this uh, struggle over defining what is New Mexico. Is it indigenous? Is it uh, European of Spanish descent? Uh, you see it with uh, the ongoing battles with uh, the Juan de Añate statue, you know, and the, uh, the uh, effects of the uh, conquest, the Spanish conquest of these territories. Uh, Suzanne, can I ask Benny a question? Yes, absolutely. Sure. Yes. Um, Benny, I'd, I'd like to ask you what your thoughts are about um, George I. Sanchez's idea of creating a, a category called New Mexican, just like you have. Yeah. Well, it, it, goes, it goes to that also that conflict that the census always runs into. They created the term Hispanic as a term of, of convenience. You know, they wanted to group all these very different groups of people that come out of uh, Central South America and Mexico and the Caribbean into one convenient category. So they mm -hmm. called it Hispanics in the 70s. Yeah, and, 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 and there's this. Not everybody's well, from Hispaniola. Exactly. You know, you, you coming from Brazil, I mean, you have Portuguese influence in Brazil, right? The only, the only country in the Americas that doesn't speak Spanish. Oh, yeah. So, so it's a, a huge diversity of people. Um, and it's kind of strange to just lump everybody as being Hispanic. Um, and, and, and similarly, just the term Asian, Asia is, is a term created by the West. Exactly. You know, Japanese, Chinese, Koreans don't really think of themselves as Asian or being the same in the same category. Um, so, but um, I, I wonder what you think, Benny, about the, the idea of, of uh, there needing to be more resources because um, the history of, of New Mexicans is, and, and, and it's, it's just that uh, people were isolated here for so many years while the rest of the world 
modernized and that there just needs to be more resources put in into um, into this state, which is so poor. I, and I think it goes to one of the previous presentations we have from uh, Dr. Linda Lopez, the Department of Sociology, around the importance of census data and how that creates the opportunities to increase your resources. You know, how people identify themselves versus how others identify, mm -hmm. you know, is, the, what, is what creates that opportunity. Uh, the, creating a category for New Mexicans would be very interesting, but would it, would it, be, would it be possible to do that? Because uh, the census is not about creating um, unique things. It's about grouping people into convenient uh, terms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, so um, I, I think the idea is why, why, why not cre create that, that category? Um, because the populations here are, are, are very unique. Um, and with unique, unique challenges. Definitely. I'll, I'll, have you, have you made connection with Dr. Linda Lopez? The I'm sociology sorry. department? I, I don't, I don't know her. I know, I know Nancy Lopez. I, um, I'm sorry, Nancy Lopez. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I know, I know her. You know, I know her she, she brings up some very interesting points around this. Yeah, we should, we should, we should talk about that. And I'll, I'll interject, Jackie also had a comment she wanted to share. She says, it seems like New Mexican as a separate census category might have been more appropriate in the 1940s as opposed to now. We have more connections with the rest of the country in modern times. Okay, that, that's interesting. Um, I, I still, I, I think that's very true, especially with communications increase with the internet, but um, I still think that that there's a lot of poverty, um, and like you know, I live near the South Valley, and just um, just looking at at what's available to to people in in New Mexico compared to, for example, where I grew up in California, that um, there are people here who can who can use some some extra resources. Thanks, so, Penny. Yeah, thank, you, thank, you. Very, thank you, Dr. Wang. Very, very interesting discussion. I just wanted to bring up this idea that um, from from uh, Georgie Zador Sanchez. Um, and we do have a few more. We do have a few more questions. Yeah. Um, so oh, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead, Suzanne. Shelley actually asked, um, "What are your thoughts about universal health care, such as the Health Security Act for New Mexico?" Well, I I think that. COVID makes it obvious that um, you have to take care of the health of every single person. Um, and if you just leave one person out, uh, that one person can see a whole entire epidemic. So, um, it, so I, I believe in universal health care. Um, I think it's, it needs to happen in uh, a civilized country. It's, it's what you have in, in most uh, countries where uh, they have an advanced uh, economy, like um, in most first world countries. And uh, I think it needs, it needs to happen. I don't know much about the um, uh, New Mexico Health Security Act, and maybe you can tell us about that. Okay, hold on just a second. Uh, Shelly, let me see if I can open your mic. Great. Hi, this is uh, Shel This is Shelley Manlev. Um, for the last 25 years, Dr. Wang, uh, a group of people have been working towards universal health care system for New Mexico. And um, it's called the, uh, the Mexicans Campaign for Health Security. Um, they, uh, a year and a half ago, received funding for a fiscal analysis from the legislature. And uh, that 
report has just been laid out, but the vision is a health system for paying for health care that would be very similar to what state employees receive and everyone, uh, you know, with a few very minor exceptions, uh, meaning if you have been a resident for less than a year, would be eligible for coverage. And um, the, like I said, the fiscal analysis is being done, and I believe at the 2021 legislative session, there'll, you know, be, be discussion um, about uh, revenue impacts. And thank you so much, Justin, for putting the link. And I think it is one of the things as I hear you talk about, and I really appreciated the history of healthcare systems, you know, one aspect of the inequity here in New Mexico that um, we really have an opportunity not to wait for the federal government, but here in our state to create a system that uh, brings much more equity in the relation to medical care. So Justin Groot, the policy chair of the Mexico Public Health Association, put a link to the Health Security for New Mexicans campaign. And I think you'll be seeing a lot of activity, but uh, need healthcare providers and all kinds of people who care about the well-being of New Mexicans to, to get involved. So look forward to sharing, if you're willing, your, your contact information with the people who are working on that, because it very much fits in the system that takes the profit. You know, it's like, God, profit in medical care. How did, you know, we ever think that really was a good idea? Um, Suzanne, can I, am I unmute, unmuted? No, you're fine. Thank you so much for bringing that up and for um, the efforts that you've, you've put into this. My goodness. Um, another thing Suzanne and I were talking about, I think that most of the healthcare dollars in New Mexico comes from federal sources anyway. Um, Medicare, Medicaid, IHS, VA, um, and even even UNM Cares is is I could, it's a it's a government um, uh, sponsored. It's I mean UNM is is uh, is government, but um, so I, I I believe at some point I saw the statistic that over uh, eighty percent of uh, health insurance in in New Mexico is. Is, is is federal government or some kind of government. And, and then you've got the for-profit corporations here just needing to increase their profits every quarter. And um, and the easiest way to do that is is just to increase the premiums, to increase the co-pays. And so, so we have our rising healthcare costs and but uh, wages are not necessarily rising. And I, I just don't know why we, we think it's why why we let this happen? I mean, um, so there's there's only a little over two million people in New Mexico, and I, I agree. There's an opportunity to just take control of this. Um, Vermont at some point uh, decided that they would have single payer. I I'm not sure how well it worked out, but but they they did that. They're a small state, um, and and New Mexico is a, a small state that's mostly government funded um, health care. And so I, I don't know why um, we, why this, why the for-profits are even allowed here. Um, for example, for behavioral health. Um, so I'm a psychiatrist and at, at some point, I, I think I was at UNM and I said, well, why doesn't UNM just take care of um, Medicaid in New Mexico for behavioral health? And somebody said that there's a law that it, it has to be a for-profit corporation from out of the state. <laughs> what what sense does that make? Um, I, d I don't know if that's still true. This is a few years ago, but um, but but yeah, I mean, and, and, and profit in healthcare is is prof profit works for other things. But Kenneth Arrow got the 1970 Nobel Prize for showing why profit does not work in medical care. Um, quite quite simply, when you are sick or when a loved one is sick, you are going to give everything you have to um, save your life or the life of somebody you love. And so it, it's, you know, they've, they've got your, you by the wallet. Um, you, you, and, 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 and the layperson cannot judge healthcare, you know, so the whole premise that um, buyer beware, it's like, you know, it, it, healthcare, it's not like buying a burger or buying a car or, you know, when, when you're sick, you go to who's around, <laughs> and um, and 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 the layperson cannot judge a, a good doctor or the quality of the medical care. You're you're and and you're you might be unconscious, 
<laughs> or just really sick, you're just at their mercy. Um, so a healthcare system in a civilized nation needs to be benevolent. It needs to um, be the foundations of, of values. The healthcare system is where decisions over life or death are made. Um, and daily they are being made by for-profit corporations. Um, I have a, I wrote a blog for the Huffington Post called Is Wall Street Making Life or Death Decisions? Uh, yes, it is. Um, is that what we want to be as a nation? So thank you for, yes, and, and I, I would love to help you out. Um, just let me know how. Thanks, Dr. Wang, and thanks, Shelley. We'll move on to the next question. Uh, Matt says, it seems like most justice issues are enforced through court rulings rather than state or national laws. Maybe a lawsuit about hospital profitability needs to happen. Um, you know, I, I, I will say as, as a physician, we are always um, thinking about like being sued for malpractice or, or something, but I don't know why um, the health insurance companies are not being sued for denying care. Like, um, for, for example, this, this my, my book, The Kitchen Shrink, it, it happened because um, well, I was trying to write a self-help book for people struggling with depression or something like that. And then there was this story that happened at UNMH that just didn't fit. Um, so uh, in the early 2000s, the, the transplant service got disbanded and I was the psychiatrist at UNMH, but I became the only physician left of what used to be the transplant service. And then there was a, a young woman who had just turned 18. And so she had been a child and I'm an adult psychiatrist. So she would, had just become my patient. And then the, the, her health insurance company decided whether she should live or die. They, they decided that she did not deserve to have a liver transplant. And this was in the early 2000s. And, and I was thinking, well, I mean, th this decision was not made by the patient. It's not made by her family. It was not made by her, her doctors. Um, uh, it, it was made by people looking at dollar signs and, and um, and, and uh, financial statements who have never met her. And that disturbed me so much that I spent all this time <laughs> writing this, The Kitchen Shrink. Um, and um, so, uh, and, and I, I don't know, I, I think that a lot of times doctors are in the, in the position of being sued, but it's really the healthcare um, health insurers who have uh, who decides who who make the final decisions in terms of what they'll pay for or not, um, and I and I, I don't know if if they are being held um, uh, legally accountable. So. Okay, so um, Benny is adding to that the law protects insurance companies over healthcare providers when it comes to life and death decisions. It is much easier to sue a physician than an insurance company. How did that come to be? Well, geez, Benny, thank you for bringing up yet another interesting um, question. Um, I, I know that it used to be that um, corporations were, uh, it, the courts used to say that corporations are not people and therefore they cannot be licensed to practice medicine. So that's why they were kept out of healthcare. And uh, now it's it's the opposite um, somehow. <laughs> so it's it's all about it's all about power. It's about the resources and um, effort that gets put into things. And um, the the people who are here right now, I I think you're the people interested in health equity in in this small state. And um, and you know you're you're knowledgeable. Um, I I. I want to encourage everybody that everything, all change starts with one person. Okay, thanks so much. 
Um, we have a, a question, a comment and a question from an anonymous attendee, so I can't open this person's mic. Um, it, it, this person said, thank you for this informative presentation, Dr. Wang. What would it take to begin to restructure our for-profit healthcare system in New Mexico or in the U.S. into a nonprofit system? Um, so I, th I think the will of the people, and I, I think that um, I, I think it is bound to happen um, because um, it's it's just not sustainable uh, in terms of the values, ethics, it's not socially stable. Um, there's gonna be a, a, a riot over this at some point or um, I, uh, so, 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 and I, I realize that you're talking about practical things. I think everybody just needs to come together um, and New Mexico can probably do it. It's such a small state, but, um, Thank you so much for that for that question. Um, I, I think that uh, just you thinking in that way. Well, what do you think um, we can do? Okay. And uh, Matt added, we need to find what language allows insurance or hospitals to be profitable. Is it written anywhere? Um. Can you say that again? I'm not sure. I quite understand. Sure. Matt said, we need to find what language allows insurance or hospitals to be profitable. Is it written anywhere? And then Sandy uh, uh, also says, the 2021 legislative session will be key. This is what the Health Security Act would accomplish for our state. So um, I'm, that's a good question. Like, where is it written that um, healthcare systems have to be for profit? Um, the, the main thing is that when some healthcare systems are for profit, then uh, the, they, the other healthcare systems get put out of business. Um, so that's why you have uh, like St. Vincent Hospital in Manhattan. It took care of survivors from the Civil War, from the Titanic, and, but it had to close. It's because when you have for profit companies taking all the money, they insure the healthy people and try not to um, uh, take care of the sick, basically. Um, then you have the nonprofit uh, hospitals and clinics taking care of the sick. And, and that's really costly. And so they can't stay open. So as long as you have some um, hospitals that are for, for profit, it puts the other ones out of business. It, it takes all the money. Because um, taking care of sickness just basically is not that profitable. It's, it's just, um, some people would say there's, there's no money in it. Like for example, if you get really sick, you lose your job, then you lose your health insurance and you can't pay the for-profit health insurers. Um, so, so where is it written that um, there is a for-profit uh, uh, um, that that healthcare is for profit. Um, it it used to be that it was written that um, for profit corporations were not allowed in healthcare, and then over eighty years or so, people kind of forgot. And um, in the seventies, Richard Nixon, um, who was a Republican president wanted universal health care. He wanted to expand Medicare. He wanted some of the same things we're talking about now. Um, he, he, he wanted and he had um, a bill before Congress, but then Watergate happened. Um, Wilbur Mills, the senator, was caught with a stripper in his car and all this happened, the Fannie Fox scandal. And, and then, so universal health care got it abandoned in the 1970s. So when Ronald Reagan took office as president in 1980, he didn't even bother to go through Congress. He just invited the for-profit corporations into health care. Um, and so um, I think what needs to happen is, well, I'll just speak from what happened before. In, in the early 1900s, there were so many quacks and tonic salesmen, and, um, and they did huge financial harm. 
I mean, people would spend a lot of money on quack cures and, um, and you know, they wouldn't get any better, their loved ones wouldn't get any better and they would be broke. And then they would chase these quacks out of town. It, it's, and I, you know, I think a lot of insurance companies are kind of like that right now. Um, they, that people give them their, their dollars hoping for to, that when they do get sick, they will have insurance, but, um, and the, not always, oftentimes the insurance company denies care to them. Um, and then, and, and so in the early 1900s, the public just got so upset about, about this that um, there were laws across the country that profit in healthcare just goes against sound public policy. Um, interestingly, medical care was not even that useful in the early 1900s. Um, the treatments of doctors were, you know, doctors applying leeches, quacks, you know, applying lancets. It wasn't that different, but it was the ethics of doctors that was different from, from the tonic salesmen and, and the quacks. It's, it's um, the whole thing of doing no harm. Um, and so in, in the early 1900s, uh, the public just felt so much pain uh, from from the quacks that they 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 chase them out. So so that's why you have the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, medicines are now regulated, and profit was banished from healthcare for until 1980 in the United States, from like the early 1900s to 1980, and um, we, we have to go back there again. Um, and I think we're getting close to that. That, that it's just uh, getting too painful. Um, uh, David Stewart was a provost at UNM, and he wrote a book called Anasazi America about the fall of Chaco Canyon. And, um, and, and uh, what he wrote about is what brought Chaco Canyon down was healthcare disparities, that um, the lifespans of the field workers were, were so much less than uh, people who lived in the great houses, like at Pueblo Bonito. Um, so, um, the people who worked in the fields, they were watching their children die. Uh, they were shorter from malnutrition. Um, they were living less long. And so, um, and so, uh, Professor, Pro, former provost David Stewart says that healthcare disparities is, is what brought down Chaco Canyon. And for the stability, for the social stability of any civilization, you have to it's more important to have equality in healthcare than equality of, you know, what kind of car you have or um, what kind of house you live in. Um, you know, it's more basic to have equality in healthcare and, and, and uh, in your, your lifespan, in, in whether your kids live or die, um, and just your quality of life. Okay, so Jackie, I, Jackie was asking if you could repeat the name and author of that book you just mentioned. Uh, Anasazi America by David Stewart. Okay, thank you. S-T-U-A-R-T. Okay. Okay, and I think that is all of the questions and comments. Oh, one more comment. Matt said he just got your book. Looking forward to learning more. So, thanks. <laughs> Um, and I think that that is all for today. So thank you so much, Dr. Wang, for your time and expertise today. We appreciate all of your efforts in helping us create an equitable New Mexico. And thank you to all of you for joining us today, as well as for our past sessions. We look forward to continuing this work, so please watch your email for more news and information. And if you are interested in learning more and participating in these efforts, please feel free to email me at Suzanne at ConstellationNM.com. And please remember to visit the nmpha.org site for their continuing conversation series that they will soon begin hosting. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon.